Good evening. It's Paul from the Garland County Library, and I am here with Judy Dare, who is the Know It to Grow It chairperson with the Garland County Master Gardeners. And hello. Hello, Judy. This is what, our 12th, 15th virtual program? I know. We've been virtual for over a year now, Paul. It's very exciting. It is. Uh, so tonight's program is Woodland Restoration in the Washita Natural National Forest. And we have a special guest with the U.S. Forest Service, Virginia McDaniel. So, uh, and Judy, you always book the, the best, most informative guest. Hey, and we've got a great lineup this year. I'm kind of blowing my intro, but we uh, got together as a group and came up with 11 really great programs. And we're really excited about having them. So, um, you want me to do my little spiel now? Sure, sure, please do. And, and before you do, um, just a reminder to our audience, questions or comments, don't hesitate to share those and we'll read those off at the end of the program. Yes. So, um, like I said earlier, uh, hello everyone and welcome to Know It to Grow It 2022. It's, it's great that we're here with everybody tonight and thank you for being such loyal to our uh, viewers, to our program. Like I said before, we have a great lineup this year and we have a regular time slot now. So the third Wednesday of each month at 6 p.m. will be our Know It to Grow It program. Our speaker next month is going to be a Master Gardener friend, Brian Carlin. He is going to talk about pruning ornamental shrubs and it's a perfect time to prune in February. So please make sure and join us. He is an expert on the subject and is a really interesting presenter. We're also happy to welcome Luke Duffel to Hot Springs as our new Garland County Extension Agent for Horticulture. He is at the Extension Office at 236 Woodbine, so if you stop in there, please tell Luke hello. And please remember that soil testing is a free service of the Extension, and if you'd like a free soil test, just put at least a pint of your soil in a Ziploc bag and take it by the office, and they'll send it off to the state lab and get you information on what you need for your soil this coming spring, because even though it doesn't seem like it, spring will be here before too long. We have a new Master Gardener class starting next month. We have 21 people taking the class, so we are very excited about that. And if any of the class of 2022 is watching tonight, we welcome you to our group. Now, as Paul said, we have we welcome questions and comments, and Virginia can answer every question you've got. Amazing person. And for the first three questions or comments, you'll get our special Know It to Grow It gift bag. Now they contain a nice garden tool, a garden kneeler, a tote, and of course our special earth key ring because you know we've only got one earth and we need to take care of it. We'll also have master gardener calendars uh, for the first three months. And these calendars are really beautiful. They have photos taken by master gardeners all around the state. So on to tonight's program. When I first heard about tonight's speaker, we were walking around a group of master gardeners in a wooded area talking about what we could do with it. And someone said, I know someone who could identify every plant here. And she was talking about Virginia. Virginia currently works for the Southern Region Station of the U.S. Forest Service in Hot Springs, where she is a forestry technician and a certified Ecological Society of America ecologist. She studies fire ecology and botany. She is on the board of the Arkansas Native Plant Society and prior to COVID-19 was active in leading botany walks and writing for the ANPS newsletter, Clantonia. She enjoys hiking, learning new plants and birding with her nine-year-old daughter, especially this year. We welcome Virginia to our program. All right. Thanks, Judy. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, and can everyone hear me okay? Yes, are we good? We're right. good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so I really appreciate the, introdu or the introduction and being able to speak to you guys about your Know It to Grow It um, speaker series. Um, I was told that you guys are all a little pollinated out. So I'm going to bring you a project that the Forest Service is working on right now with woodland restoration that actually benefits pollinators, but I'll only touch on that kind of briefly at the end. Um, so as she said, I work for the Southern Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service here in, here in Hot Springs. 
And um, with this presentation, I guess let's let's just get right into it. I will bring my screen up. Okay, so I think I just hit slideshow and we're good to go. Hide that. All right, can everyone see the see the um, first slide? Yes, it's it's on the screen. You're good. Okay. All right. Awesome. Just want to make sure. All right. So what I'm going to do with this presentation is I'm going to talk um, a bit about the historical landscape of Arkansas and what we know from early accounts about what it looked like. You know, give some reasons about why it looked like that, and then move on to um, a restoration project that is happening on the Washta National Forest in western Arkansas and eastern Oklahoma. And then end the discussion with uh, some common native species that you'll see in kind of a high quality intact woodland across the southeast and uh, talk a little bit about why native plants are important. And then at the end, the end, the finale is pretty awesome. The Forest Service has just put together three different videos on restoration. And one of those videos focuses on this very project that I'm gonna talk about, this woodland restoration, the pine blue stem ecosystem and the red cockaded woodpecker. Um, gonna get, get to all that in a bit. But anyway, it's about a six or seven minute video and it just came out, it's hot off the press. It's not even on the um, Washita National Forest website. They haven't figured out how to do it yet. So you guys are gonna see it like before anybody. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, has the outline just talk about some historical landscapes, the restoration project, and then um, native species. So one of the, the earliest accounts that we have of the landscape in Arkansas was made by William Dunbar and Dr. George Hunter in 1804 and 1805. And the Hunter-Dunbar expedition was, was one of four ventures that was commissioned by Thomas Jefferson to explore the Louisiana Purchase. And it occurred concurrently with the, the weller known Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, so the rivers were the main means of, of travel routes at the time. And their job was to explore up the Washita River to where it empties into the Black River up to um, current day Hot Springs, Arkansas. And so Hunter was coming from Pittsburgh and he designed a boat that was kind of meant for deeper water, you know, the larger rivers that he was accustomed to up in the Northeast. And so they had some struggles in these rocky, shallow waters, the Washtaw, I don't know if you've ever been on the Washtaw, you know, it can get pretty, pretty shallow at times. And so they spent a lot of time there in this book, it was talking about, you know, the difficulty of, of bringing the water, of bringing this boat up, up these channels in rather cold conditions, because they were, they were traveling in uh, November through February. Um, and at one point, Hunter, he was cleaning his gun and he nearly shot his thumb and two fingers off. So it's got some, you know, thrills in this in this in this account so it's it's well well worth a read um but what i was looking for uh when i read it was kind of understanding the, the historic landscape it's one of these quotes you know he says a league from the river above the slate quarry was a considerable plain called prairie de champignon and it was frequented by buffalo so we know if buffalo are here we know we had to have some considerable um grasslands in order for them to have have enough food Another early traveler was Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, um, and he hails from the, the state of my youth, upstate New York. And at the age of at age of five, he traveled with his friend Levi Pettibone, Pettibone down to what is now Springfield, Missouri, <clears throat> onto the Ozark Plateau and the Mark Twain. They explored down the White River into, into northern Arkansas in 1818 and 1819. And he was especially interested in the geology, but he also makes like he makes some really nice notes on the culture and the landscape and the vegetation. Um, the two, they were a bit young and ill-prepared for their adventure. I think they talked about like they didn't even know how to use a gun. They got lost in the woods more than once. They often went hungry. Um, but his, he's a really engaging writer um, and he provides valuable insight into what the 19th century landscape looked like. And so this is a quote from his, I'm sorry, I didn't, I guess I, Thought I had the, his book, but anyway, this is a quote from his, um, of his journey to the of 
sorry, journal of a tour into the interior of Missouri and Arkansas. So one thing we're noticing, the atmosphere was smoky. The lands were were sterile. They called them sterile, you know, because they didn't, didn't have a lot of timber. There was just a lot of like grass on the ground. Um, and he just talks about how, you know, the trees were kind of shrubby. There wasn't very much under underbrush or anything like that. Um, and then I just thought every with each entry, he would note how far he traveled. And at the end of one of his times, he was like, distance 14 miles, acorns for supper. <laughs> so anyway, it was a little, <laughs> but anyway, it's a really, a really a worthwhile read if you're interested in, in understanding the historic landscapes of Arkansas and Missouri. And then Thomas Nuttall. Um, Thomas Nuttall, he was the um, one of the first uh, trained botanists documented vegetation in Arkansas. He also traveled in 1818 to 1819, the same year as Schoolcraft. Unlike the two previous explorers um, who were here in the winter, he, he stayed through the summer. And he was also the first explorers that, so he's the first explorers to travel in a season where he could actually see um, the vegetation, like see the, the, the flowers. Um, he bought a skiff for six bucks in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania traveled down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. And um, in 1818, it was rather a treacherous adventure. I mean, those rivers are really big and it was it was after the earthquake of 1812. Um, so he had all these uprooted huge trees. And I mean, he had some pretty crazy stories of nearly having his boat nearly sink um, in the river. <clears throat> um, and so of course, Arkansas was the frontier at that time. and. There were outlaws that swindled him, but he also met a lot, a lot of generous people. You know, there obviously weren't restaurants or hotels or anything. He was dependent upon staying in people's houses. Um, so he ultimately made it down. He traveled up the Arkansas River and made it all the way um, to Fort Smith. And when he was traveling, um, anyway, I should just, uh, I can, I'll just read the quote. Sorry. In this direction, the surface of ground is thinly broken or undulated and thinly scattered with trees, resembling almost a cultivated park. So he talks about that a whole bunch, like how it just like a park like landscape. And then this is one of my favorite things. He talks about that the rich, it was richly enameled with a with a profusion of beautiful and curious flowers. And uh, yeah, this is from his book, The Trout. Journal of Travels into Arkansas Territory during the year 1819. And then he also noticed that uh, the surrounding woodland, he couldn't perceive any reason why there weren't trees except for the annual conflagration, which was fire. And um, this, what tells me today is that in our in our management of the land right now, we're always we're always fighting this woody vegetation. And you, you can see in this picture here, those brown kind of top killed, um, here, top, top killed trees. And you basically need fire in order to, to kill those smaller trees so that it will allow this, this lush growth of, of grasses and flowers and that kind of thing. And, you know, he was noticing it back then, you know, it was really fire is what's main, maintaining the system as, as open. Um, I have a little note here at the bottom. Uh, it was the bicentennial of his journey through Arkansas two years ago, and Theo Witzel gave a talk at the Clinton School for Public Service um, at that time, and it's it's on YouTube, and it's a really great talk um, if you're interested in learning about historic landscapes and botany. He was he's the he used to be the state botanist, and now he's the chief ecologist, I believe, for the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. Um, so what we see with these early accounts um, is that, you know, smoke was in the air and the woods were open. And so, you know, you kind of put two and two together and you kind of think, well, fire is probably a reason for, for maintaining these systems. Um, and in Arkansas, we also have, you know, physical evidence of fire in these fire scarred trees. So we recently had a study of the fire history of Arkansas that was done by um, Dr. Will Flatley and his student uh, Lillian McDaniel, who's no relation to me um, that I know of. <clears throat> anyway, they came up with a 
a fire return of about three to 14 years. And so that also tells us that fire was really important process on the landscape. And then I'm just going to skip over that and let's get on, get on to this. Um, so, but by the, the 1970s, um, 150 years after Nuttall traveled through these woods, um, the forest in Arkansas look, looked a lot different. Um, we have had 100 years of basically fire suppression. Um, and so the woods, the open woods that were covered with that profusion of beautiful and curious flowers had been replaced by this closed canopy forest with a lot of small sapling sh sh trees that, that shaded um, shaded the forest, a lot of leaf litter, where not many understory plants can grow. Um, but in the 1970s, one of the main issues, a big issue on the Washington National Forest was the near extinction of a bird that had just been listed as endangered. And that um, was the red cockaded woodpecker. And I just put this map in here just so you see, I think, I mean, you guys pretty much know where we are. Um, we're here in the interior highlands, which is Northwest Arkansas, Southern Missouri and Eastern Oklahoma. And so the dark green recommend, represents the Washita Mountain ecoregion. And then the Washita National Forest is this light green area. It's about 1.8 million acres. All right, so our star here, the red cockaded woodpecker. So the red cockaded woodpecker is primarily a coastal plain species. So it lives in the longleaf pine forest. Uh, but there were several inland populations of this bird, and one of those was found in the forests of, of Arkansas. But the species needs <clears throat> old growth trees in order to survive. So those trees that are over 90 years old, that are beginning to have a little bit of heart rot in the middle, because this is a woodpecker, one of the few woodpeckers that builds its nest in living trees. And so having that heart rot made it a little bit easier to hollow out the, those cavities. Um, and it also requires a really open understory to forage. It can't forage in that that thick, thick, thick forest. So <clears throat> at the time, you know, kind of the Forest Service basically kind of threw their hands up. They're like, I don't know, the, the, the population's declining. I don't know what we can do. We're, we're done. And then the Forest Service, or sorry, the Fish and Wildlife Service said, an endangered species, guys, you guys have to do something. <laughs> and so at this point, the forest, we started um the thinning and burning so we'd thin the forest about a basal area of about 70 and then put it burn it on a rotation of every three to four years and over the next several decades we created this landscape that kind of began to resemble this real open area that 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 you know nuttall and all these early explorers had had seen um as they traveled and so what we also noticed in this graph, this graph is not necessarily from just the Washita, but it shows the red is the number of acres that's burned and the blue is the active red cockaded, red cockaded woodpecker clusters. So as we burn more, as we start creating that habitat, the birds come back, you know, and that's what's been amazing. So this, this species was basically on the brink of extinction from the Washita National Forest around 19 late 80s 90 and then with a couple of decades of work um the numbers i have i know that doesn't say it's on this graph but in 2000 there were about 48 birds with 15 nesting attempts 13 years later there were 158 birds with 58 nesting attempts so we basically tripled the number of birds and quadrupled the number of nesting attempts um which is pretty awesome and so this is this is what a restored area on uh, in the Washita looks like. And then kind of tagging along on the coattails of this restoration work for this one kind of keystone species, this red cockaded woodpecker, were many other species of plants, butterflies, reptiles, deer. We've had lots of studies were conducted over the last three decades comparing the species composition of the pine blue stem woodland to the closed canopy forest. And we found like the number of flowering plants, 
the number of plants that deer eat, nectar plants for pollinators, habitat for reptiles, it's all increased in these in these woodland areas. And I'm not saying that closed canopy forest doesn't have its place. Obviously, that it's it's an important for for some species. But when you have 95% closed canopy and 5% open, it's it's not enough. Like historically, it probably would have been more like 60, 70%, you know, open woodland and then 30 or 40% um, closed canopy. So, oh, okay. <clears throat> All right, and then there was, um, an interesting story. And then I guess the other side of the story is that even while all this restoration work was getting done, we still had a steady stream of timber that was being cut for mills and keeping um, the, the mills in business. And an interesting story that I just want to tell you was after Hurricane Sandy hit the Northeast in, in 2012, I believe it was, um, a walkway on Coney Island was really badly damaged. And they needed southern pine rated as dense and a mill that could handle um, the large size of the boards that they needed. So I think they needed 16 foot boards with a certain width. Anyway, the only place that they could get this, this kind of wood that there was the density they needed to support this walkway was shortleaf pine in the Washtenaw National Forest. And um, the lumber that went to rebuild that walkway on Coney Island was milled by the Travis Lumber Company and most likely came from the Potal Cold Springs District of the Washtenaw National Forest, which is that picture that I just showed you from that area right there was where, where, where the trees came from. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's just pretty cool that the Forest Service, you know, is preserving the habitat of an endangered species taking so many other species along on the coattails and then providing a steady stream of, of high quality timber as well. I mean, it's just, I don't know, it's just a pretty great story about management and, and how it can work for uh, e ecology and economics at the same time. All right, and so the Washtenaw National Forest has been working on this pine blue stem ecosystem for the last three decades with thinning and prescribed fire. Um, and they recently got some funding for um, this program called the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Pro Project. And so it's a nationally funded project to fast track restoration on forest lands. And so the idea was to use this, this money to restore 320,000 acres, which is about um, of the Washtenaw National Forest. So that's about 18% of the forest. And I think this project has been going on 10 years. Don't quote me exactly, but I know we've restored over 200,000 acres. So we're well on the way, well on the way to getting there. Um, and I was gonna talk a little bit about um, the monitoring that we're doing, but, and I grabbed this from another slide. So basically we've got monitoring plots all over the forest and these monitoring plots, we, we measure all of the overstory in these 10 meter uh, radius plots. We've got a subplot for shrubs and then these four meter square hectare, or sorry, meter square plots that we measure, sorry, we identify every single species in those plots <clears throat> down to species and get a cover estimate. And the grass got kind of messed up. I had to put this into Google Slides, and so the grass kind of lost their stuff. So um, basically the gray area is desired future condition. The first set of plots is the overstory, which like we're moving in the right direction, not there. Once again, the mid story is there on the right. We're also moving in the right direction, but we don't quite have the structure there yet. Um, and this is looking at the ground species layer. And basically the, the first two grass on the left um, are either unburned or just thinned. And those you can see haven't reached that, that little white box of dots. That's your desired ecological condition, which is over 15 species per plot. Um, but the message here is the areas that have been burned and thinned 
which is the gray is burned and then the white bar is burned and thin those have reached the desired ecological condition they are they are have they have the diversity the number of species that we're looking for but i won't bore you with that anymore so <laughs> basically this is what we've done we've taken these closed canopy forests in that upper picture opened up that mid-story use prescribed fire to bring nutrients back to those plants and now we have this open system that has a really diverse understory with flowering plants that can support pollinators, insects, birds, reptiles, all kinds of things. Actually, actually, I even just, I, this is crazy, I read a study about the relationship between fire and crayfish. I mean, who would have thought that? Fire also benefits crayfish. When you don't burn, you get more woody stems, they found that you have less crayfish um, chimneys, less openings. And they haven't quite related it to the number of crayfish, but they're, they're working on that. But anyway, more fire, more crayfish, pretty cool. Um, alrighty, now I thought we would talk about um, just some species. I don't know how If everyone's good, we'll just keep going and just talk about a few of the species that we might find um, in a high quality woodland area in the Washita. Um, there are over 600 species of plants associated with woodlands in Arkansas. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about the plants, a little, a little bit about pollinators and yeah, host plants. So the composite family, the composite family has the greatest number of species of all Arkansas plants. There are 321 species in this family. And so everyone's pretty familiar with the black eyed Susans. You probably know Echinacea. You got the purple cone flower to the left with that Gulf fritillary and then the pale purple cone flower to the right. Um, it's used medicinally to treat colds and flus, among other ailments. We probably all need a little bit of echinacea in our life right now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see. And it's also a really important pollinator plant. Like you got the Gulf fritillary and the, the buckeye, the common buckeye. Um, and then I'm just going to give you a real brief botany lesson. All right. So everyone, you think of this flower, you're like, oh, that's a pretty flower. That actually isn't just a flower. It's an inflorescence made up of hundreds of flowers. So the composite family is made up of ray flowers, which you think of, you think this is a petal, but it's really a ray flower. It's a flower in and of itself. And then you have disc flowers. So the composite family is a composite of two different kinds of flowers, ray flowers and disc flowers. <laughs> And then the cool thing about the disc flowers, you see that these just these out ones, these outer flowers are opening up. So pollinators can come and, and get nectar from these plant, this plant today. And then tomorrow, a couple more rows will open up in, in, in that cone. And so this is going to provide, you know, a flower source for for days and days for lots of different lots of different um, pollinators. It's kind of cool. Um, the thistle family, <clears throat> another really important um, pollinator plant is the thistle. And I know the common reaction when you see a thistle is to kill it uh, because there's bull thistle is really common. It's an invader of farm fields and this and that. But however, in the United States, there are 96 species of thistles. 92 of them are native. Right. There's only four non-native thistles in the country. <laughs> and in the southern southeastern United States, there are nine species of thistle and seven of those are native. So I really encourage you to look twice before you think about um, killing a thistle. Even this super mean looking one, Circium herigulum, that's its scientific name. Um, it's native. It's a favored plant for pollinators, including, yeah, the monarch and the painted lady. And then the composite family got the, the prairie gay feather, which is true to its name, it grows in prairies. Often, you often see it in remnant prairies. 
And uh, if you guys drive up seven north of Hot Springs, you can see a bunch of really nice patches along the road. And uh, the tick seed, also nice plant in early June. And then on the right is the Washita Blazing Star, this plant right here. And this is special. It is an endemic plant to the Washita Mountains in Arkansas, which means it's found here and nowhere else in the world which is pretty cool. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about monarchs. You guys know way too much about monarchs, but I do wanna talk a little bit about host plants. So, you know, we all know the monarch and they need they need milkweeds. Everyone's like, we gotta plant milkweed, blah, blah, blah. But every single butterfly species has a host plant. Some of them are generalists and they have can have a, eat a few families of plants, but some of them are really specific. Like this is the spicebush swallowtail. It lays its eggs on spicebush or sassafras. We lose spicebush and sassafras, we lose the spicebush butterfly. Right? So that's why it's so important to plant a diversity of plants uh, in your, your plant a pollinator garden or whatever or if you're restoring an ecosystem a woodland ecosystem it's it's so important to have that really nice diversity and then the spice bush i just love this 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 uh caterpillar because it starts its first end star looks like bird poop which is such a great camouflage or um defense mechanism against birds right and then as it grows up then it gets these huge eye spots and looks like a snake which I think is also totally awesome. All right, my last composite plant that we're gonna talk about is ironweed. It's nice purple flowers in the fall. It makes a um, nice contrast to the goldenrod that's blooming at the same time. Also really nice. Da -da -da. Milkweeds, milkweed, milkweeds, beautiful, awesome, wonderful plants. <laughs> uh, violets. Um, Violets are awesome because they are the host plant of the Diana Fridleri, which is our state butterfly. Um, and Diana Fridleris are pretty cool. One thing is they're sexually dimorphic, which means the male and the female look different. So the female is blue and black and the male is orange and black. Oh, another cool thing is that this, this, this butterfly used to be on our sensitive species list. Like it wasn't threatened or endangered, but it was one that we really need to watch out for but with all the woodland restoration we've done it's now much more common than it was and it was taken off our sensitive species list so that was good news the restoration is working um the mint family i like to think of the mint family as kind of like pollinator crack because i just love it this mountain mint over here on the right if you could zoom in you'd see probably 25 different individuals bees wasps butterflies and other insects jumping on that um one other thing i really want to give a huge shout out to is the people that took these pictures mike weatherford um and eric hunt with the arkansas native plant society one of the reasons why the pictures in this presentation are so nice is because mike and eric um any plant that any picture that has like a pollinator in it Mike Weatherford probably took that, and all the beautiful flower, straight up flower pictures were from Eric Hunt. And then, you know, pea family, also really nice plant to be fine in woodlands. Bush clovers, big bush clovers and beggar's lice. This is another one of those um, <clears throat> plants that's really, really good for wildlife. And I know that you guys might be aware of um, Ceresia lespedeza, right? Everyone, it was planted everywhere. The Forest Service planted it everywhere. And now we're trying to kill it because it was it, it, it didn't make really good food source or quail habitat or anything. But this is another one like the thistles is that um, the Desmodium, the group of beggar's lice, there are 18 species in Arkansas. All but one is native, and the Lespedezas, they're 10, and all but three of those are native. So it's a, a really important um, plant, the composition of, of a lot of these woodlands. And um, this, I think this is my final picture here. 
grasses. A lot of people don't think about grasses as being a pollinator plant, um, but there's a lot of a lot of different um, uh, pollinators that do raise lay eggs on on different kinds of grasses. You got Indian grass here, some of the panic grasses, switchgrass. Um, so it's just another um, another plant to think. And, and they're also grasses are pretty beautiful. I think they're 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 kind of attractive. So that's that's the end of of my presentation. Um, conclusion is, you know, fire is important. Fire helps flowers grow. It all helps a lot of different species. And I guess I'll open it up to questions if anybody has any any questions before we get to the video. Hey, Virginia, that was awesome. I've got a question about um, crawfish holes. So we have a garden out past the detention center and that's where we're going to do the burn and, and do all that. But their benefit to society, uh, the pollinator society is, I guess, eating for the birds, a lovely snack for the birds, because we find crawfish skeletons all over our garden area. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 You know, one of the pictures, because I just wrote this little article about the, yeah, the crawfish and fire. And one of the pictures that the scientist sent me was a picture of a sandhill crane eating um, a crayfish. So, so yeah, I think birds do like them as a little tasty snack for sure. But what, what, what other benefit do they actually bring? I mean. Oh, um, cray crayfish? Yeah. Um, well, I would, that is a very interesting question. And I think it's one that they're still kind of trying to understand. I mean, I'm assuming like maybe their poop is, it provides, you know, nutrients to the, to the, um, I can see that we've lost you a little bit. And, uh, She's just looking at the the crayfish species that are found in that restoration project. So there, there clearly must be some some kind of benefit, but they're still figuring out. They don't even know what crayfish eat. They're really hard to study, you know, because they're just like. All of our raised beds. I mean, it's amazing. You know, well, everybody's like, "What is that hole?" I said, "Crayfish." crayfish. And there are little bodies everywhere. You know, so somebody's had lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're a food source. That's yeah. Paul, do we have any more questions? Well, people are being shy. Um, all of you Facebook and YouTube viewers need to speak up. Uh, but we have a nice comment from Susan. What an awesome presenter and super interesting program. And it's the most time I've heard the word poop used in any of our programs. So I think it's really great. <laughs> you have a nine-year-old, you know. Yeah, well, well, poop happens. Well, maybe, maybe you need to do a whole program on fertilizer and, and this there record will be beat. Yeah. <laughs> now, another thing that we found at Hope Garden is um, that the passion vine is a host plant for a fritillary carolina fritillary i think yes so it's really fun that we go out and we're trying to you know keep everything like for vegetables but all this wild stuff keeps coming up and we're like wow we keep <laughs> finding different things but uh, you know i i agree with jody i don't think anyone could know as many plants as you know ever um, there are people let me tell you there are i know a fair <laughs> number but i know some people that know way more than me <laughs> awesome very fun thank very you fun. well is it is it video time yeah let's watch this video this is all right so. and it'll get it'll tell you way more than i told you about the red cockade woodpecker too so i just kind of touched on that
most endangered species has something unique about them that they need a very specific niche or type of habitat to meet their needs. The red cockaded woodpecker is not any different. Flying squirrels are probably one of our biggest issues. They uh, take over the cavities and trash them up to where the birds can't use them. So probably our biggest uh, issues that we have to deal with. They'll eat eggs and young as well. So um, they're kind of a, a problem all the way around. The red cockaded woodpecker is an endangered species that we have here on the wash tall. We've got a wide variety of tools that we use to manage for the species. We restrict the cavities to keep them from being enlarged. We clean the cavities out, remove the squirrels and relocate them. We monitor their nesting activity and the recruitment of the species. The management of the timber, the thinning of the timber, restoring the mid-story condition to appropriate densities and the use of fire to maintain it all. It's all intertwined together to provide habitat in this ecosystem. Most people had never even seen this species and I get to work with it daily, helping provide what it needs to survive and thrive. We know from historic accounts of travelers, a lot of the forests were comprised of old trees, open stands with a lot of herbaceous vegetation and forbs in the understory. And that's what shortly pine blue stem really is. It's a prairie underneath the forest. The reason for these stands being open was that they burned regularly. They burned regularly on their own and they were burned regularly prior to European settlement. Native Americans were burning these woods for a long time, across the United States, actually. We harvested the virgin forest from 1880 to 1920 across the South. That was followed by a period where wildfires were pretty common and had fairly devastating in those cutover stands. And so society invested an awful lot of effort in controlling wildfire. unintended side effects. And one of those side effects is that we lost flora and fauna that are adapted to a fire adapted condition. We had a lot of overstocked, dense stands with woody mid stories because of fire suppression and fire exclusion. A lot of things had been lost. Elk were gone, bison were gone. We almost lost red cockaded woodpeckers. We got off on the right foot by having research scientists look. Here's the problem. You've got to have landscapes of open stands, herbaceous understories, and older trees. Once they gave us that answer, they gave us an objective. Okay, we had a regional variance today for humidity dropping down below 24%. Um, so, so we did get approval for that. Fire to me, as far as prescribed burning goes, is kind of fascinating in a way. You're taking an element that can run out of control and then you're trying to make it do the things that you want it to do. And so there's a lot of art to that. Implementing the control burns allows us to plan. And then so fire's now on our terms. We're reducing the fuels by implementing a control burn. We're setting the plan parameters, the goals and objectives for the burn. You know, these places evolved and adapted with frequent fire. Fire here under the right situation is something that is right as rain for these ecosystems. It's an amazing tool to clean up the landscape, to reset it. If you're successful and you're able to burn through those areas, and then you come back in the spring and you see that beautiful green grass growing everywhere, there's a ton of satisfaction in that. It's a great thing to help the ecology of the area. There is a pretty simple recipe for restoring these forests. You do prescribe fire under the appropriate conditions at the right time of year and you implement certain types of timber management activities and you monitor that and you see where you're going annually with those tools. 
without managing timber and then selling that as wood products in a sustainable long-term way, then you have no way to finance the prescribed burning or anything else you want to do out there. Done in the right way, you can fund in perpetuity restoration. It's like an autopilot. Using these tools, fire, timber, thinnings, we begin to build a pretty incredible, biodiverse, healthy, and resilient place for nature and people. This all began really with the Red Cockaded Woodpecker. We started, we had about nine groups. And today, we've got more than 70 groups. This population fledges more than 100 young every breeding season. That's a huge success for an endangered species. That's the basic metric for is the work successful. But we've come to realize that creating this habitat to help the red cockaded woodpecker has helped dozens of other species of flora and fauna that we value as well. It is a lot of work, but it's not just managing for the red cockaded woodpecker. It's taking care of the whole ecosystem, providing habitat for all the species here. What a great story. Awesome. Yeah, that was an awesome video. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah no, I'm glad, that, I'm glad that worked out. Hope for the future. Yeah, we learned a lot about technology today. <laughs> all right, are we, so we, are we off? Are we, we're, we're still on, we're still live. Oh, we're still live, okay, yeah, we, sorry. We, we, okay, we awesome. <laughs> cool, cool, no, it was, yeah, they just, just came out with that video and yeah, you did a really great job. So absolutely, and you did a really great job, and I learned an awful lot. And I really thank you for being here. And everybody was really excited. Everybody I talked to this week were like, "Virginia's going to be on tonight." And I'm like, "Yes, yes." So <laughs> thank you for doing this for us. Absolutely, we do have a couple things from the audience. Um, and while I'm reading these, if anyone else has anything, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, comment from Bob. Uh, a question. Uh, I know the Forest Service are busy people and don't need a lot of distractions, but do they ever offer a chance for citizens to witness or assist in the survey process you mentioned? The survey of, um, of plants? Um, I think we, given the COVID situation, I haven't even been allowed in my office in a year. Um, but when COVID is over, we definitely would welcome um, volunteers to come help with, the, you know, with the vegetation monitoring or anything like that. Absolutely. We would definitely take some help. So um, on that note, can, are there any other ways that uh, people can get involved to, to help assist? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> Probably too too many to name. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think I don't have a good answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question from Cindy. Uh, and, and if you if you do think of anything, uh, we'll be happy to post it and share okay. it on the yeah, library. Yeah, for sure. And, um, for sure. Question from Cindy, do you think forest restoration will help bring back the quail? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I know that uh, two of those guys that were in the in that um, presentation are, are big quail hunters. And one of the places they go is the Pine Blue Stem area of the Washita, the Pine Blue Stem restored woodland area. And there are lots of coveys of quail there. Also, awesome. yes, it definitely helps the quail. Did you say coven of quail? Is that the name? Oh, of I think it's, I probably say it wrong. I say covey. Oh. 
Yeah. I, I thought you said coven like a group of witches. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. There's a whole new dimension to quail. Yeah. <laughs> well, Judy, how about you? Can you think of any uh, frequently asked questions your master gardeners might have? Well, too many to mention. I, I wish I'd written some notes down, but I was kind of mesmerized by everything. Um, I'm trying to rehab a little piece of property and I'm trying to find a great tree that doesn't grow that big. Like I'm talking 15 feet that would provide some kind of nutrition to birds and also some cover. So I would. I'm always, I'm a big proponent of, of dogwoods and, and red buds. Awesome. I think they're just really, you know, I think they look good in combination too. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're two different families. They flower at similar times, um, but provide different sources. You know, those, the red berries of the dogwood provide food for, for a while into the summer. Um, and yeah, they're just attractive. They're not that big. Those would be two, two suggestions. Awesome. I've got some red bud planted, so I'll get some dogwood, but <laughs> yeah. you know, through this journey of know it to grow it, what I found is that everything makes me think more about what we can do to help the situation we're in now, which is, you know, we are highly urbanized. We, we don't have enough uh, forest for, you know, in our urban areas. So we're, the master gardeners are thinking, you know, we need to plant like a little patchwork national park. So we're all trying to do that. That is Jody Took's um, kind of vision for us all. So we're trying to to do those kind of things. So seeing what you were talking about tonight, and and we are we we did kind of overdo the pollinator thing, but you did not. And there are other things that we um, have seen that in this program that I hadn't thought about before. So I really just think everybody who is joining these programs on a monthly basis is learning so much about what we can do just to keep everybody going. I mean, whether it's a butterfly, a bird, uh, a crayfish, a lizard, we need to do that because even, so I brought some plants in the house and they have fungus gnats. Okay, I've been fighting fungus gnats for weeks now. I don't think I'm winning, but I'm still fighting. But someone said, you know, really, even a fungus gnat has a place in the ecosystem yeah. and or we wouldn't have it. So, you know, all these things kind of add up to a, a real beautiful picture of what, you know, we need to be doing. And people like you and the people you work with really impress me by how knowledgeable you are and how you can help us understand what we need to do. So thank you very much. Right. No, and I love I love that idea of taking little small pieces of land in the city, you know, your yard, a bank, wherever, and just working to to restore those areas, plant some native plants. And I think it's just great, you know, because you are you're making a patchwork, you're making corridors, basically, for all these animals to, to survive. So, in fact, we were sitting on the porch the other night when it was warm. And my husband says, we live in a, a very populated neighborhood. And he goes, I think I just saw a fox. And sure enough, I called my neighbor who lives around the bay and there was a fox running on the on the lake bed, trying oh. to get away from us, I'm sure. Right, right, but right. how fascinating that there was a fox. So yep. Yep. anyway, great. That's all I got, Paul, I'll stop talking. We, we had a question come in from Sheena who says, I'm looking for a ground cover that would help prevent erosion. It must be good for households with big dogs and the ground cover cannot have berries. Any thoughts? Uh, the ground cover can't have berries like that the dogs shouldn't eat, maybe? I have one. Yes, go, 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 go. Um, I planted micro clover and I had not heard of micro clover before, but it is just a, it's a micro clover and it flowers and it is drought resistant. It is green now and it is spreading like crazy. And I haven't read anything about it being other than killing out some weeds that, you know, it might be harmful. And I've also planted common uh, violet. 
Mm, yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I think there. I don't think there are any non-native violets. I think all the violets that I that I know. I don't that are that are all native, and they're all, as I said, a you know the host plant for the Diana Fritillary, the state state butterfly. So that's that sounds good. Um, I do know there is one evergreen. Um, it's a little vine. It does have a red berry, but it's edible. You know, anybody can eat it. Um, partridge berry. Hmm. It's it's it kind of stays green all year long. You'd have to find a specialized native plant nursery to get it. They're not going to sell it at Lowe's or anything. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, it's just a little a little ground cover. That's not like English ivy. Or it's going to take over. Um, but. Sheena says the the berries would be crushed by the dog's feet and tracked aside. <laughs> tracked inside. Oh, <laughs> so these are small. They're they're yeah. Anyway, <laughs> they the, uh, follow up question about your answer is common violet evergreen. Is common violet evergreen? I don't think so. I think they lose their leaves. Is it? I don't know. You, you're planting it, Judy. I just planted it. We uh, just planted see it grows just a little ways. But uh, I don't think it is. But I've got some at the property now. Mm -hmm. That was that was that was blooming about a month ago. But of course, we've had record heat, so I, I can't really say. Yeah, yeah. Um, one other one other plant that it's it's a little weedy, but it's native. It's columbine, and it stays green all through the year, and it it readily seeds. I think it's an, it's an annual, but it readily reseeds itself. Um, and it just, it kind of looks like a maidenhair fern, but it has beautiful red flowers in the spring. I think the hummingbirds like it. Um, anyway, I don't know what eats it, but. Check out the micro clover because you don't have to mow it. It's got little bitty tiny clover uh, flowers on it and. Yeah. Oh, you don't have to. Uh, stay, stay small then. That's it nice. stays small. Not mowing is my goal. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, what was the micro plant Judy mentioned? It's micro clover and you can Google it. Um, and I, I just wanted to find a ground cover that I didn't have to mow. And that was uh, good for bees basically. And that's what it came up with was micro clover. And I bought two pounds of it and put it out, put some leaf mulch on it and it started growing and has, I had a terrible erosion problem. And it's really held the ground and I'm looking forward to seeing what it does during the summer. So I'm not an expert. I'm not certified in anything, but it's looking pretty good. Uh, Belinda asks, which is preferred? Belinda, don't, don't type in <laughs> I can't spell. I mean, uh, pronounce. <laughs> uh, Belinda's a master. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop this one on the screen so I don't embarrass myself. Okay. Oh, Asteraceae or Compositae. Oh, uh, it's, uh, either one. I'm not sure, to be honest. I use both. I kind of use them inter interchangeably. What are they? <laughs> oh, sorry. They're the family. They're the, they're, it's like the Aster family. It has two different names. It's either the Aster family or the Composite family. So Asteraceae or Compositae. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, because sometimes families have two different, I don't know why they have two different, that's a great question. Some, some, probably two taxonomists duking it out, trying to think, oh, my name's better than your name. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm not sure which is the standard. I'd have to look up um, a book. Probably, and they probably, anyway, they're probably used interchangeably. Just depends upon which who wrote it. As a side note, Belinda is going to be one of our guest speakers this year, and she's going to be talking about um, snakes in Arkansas. So, oh, cool, yeah. exciting. Yeah. Well, Belinda's done several programs uh, with us at the library, and a few of them are, are virtual. And she used to be a library employee. Oh. Um, that's just like her to throw me a curveball. <laughs> I can't tell if it was intentional or not. That's funny. All right. Well, um, Virginia, thank you for joining us. Uh, that was your great guest. And Judy, thank you for picking another great guest. 
Um, and, and, and thank you for sharing that presentation and that video with us. They were both very enjoyable. Um, yeah. Thanks well, for having well, me. Absolutely. Uh, remind everyone where they can learn more about woodland restoration and protecting our national forest. Um, you can learn more by going to the Washtenaw National Forest uh, uh, page, like the web page or Facebook. I'm sure they have both. Awesome. Thanks, Virginia. It was great. Great fun, everybody. <laughs> and uh, Judy, uh, like you said at the beginning, our, our next program and, and all of our programs this year are going to be on the same time slot, the third Wednesday every month at 6 p.m. Um, we hopefully at some point in the year, we can have a, a blended program and do them both in person and, and live stream it like this. So people have an option. Uh, the next one is going to be uh, virtual for sure in February. Uh, and that will be on Wednesday, February 16th. And remind them what the topic is. It's going to be pruning ornamentals. And uh, we're actually going to have some uh, videos of Brian pruning um, lace wing Japanese maples, lace leaf, sorry, lace leaf map Japanese maples, which are, you know, you need all these spe special tools and all that. We saw this video on it. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that by myself. He shows up with a pruner and a knife and my tree looks great. So um, it's it's just taking care of your ornamentals. Your you know, we've had some really terrible weather last year that damaged so many things. So your azaleas and your camellias and your small maples. So he'll be going through all that with us. And, you know, he is the bonsai guru. Um, so he, the man knows everything about pruning and is a great speaker. So that should be really fun too. Sounds good. Looking forward to it as always. And uh, if you enjoyed this program, uh, please uh, share this. Uh, the recorded version is available on our Facebook and YouTube in the videos archive, as are all of the past Know What to Grow It videos and all the future ones will be as well. So um, enjoy those, share those, uh, tell your friends to watch them. Okay. Well, everybody, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Absolutely. Take care.